welcome back to Rating the List, where we review, discuss, and reimagine popular movie lists objectively. We're your hosts, I'm Jerry. And I'm Brad. And on this episode, we'll be exploring number 28 from Sports Illustrated's The Top 50 Sports Movies of All Time. All right, number 28 is Eight Men Out, released in 1988, directed by John Sayles, starring John Cusack, Clifton James, and Jace Alexander. The 1919 Chicago White Sox accept bribes from gamblers and throw the World Series despite being huge favorites, resulting in eight players, known as the Black Sox, being banned from the game. Really good movie. This is kind of a high point in our list so far for me because John Sayles is one of my favorite filmmakers and he rarely shows up on things like mm -hmm. AFI lists and things like that. He is the quintessential independent film director. This is one of the few movies that he had any kind of studio involvement in. Um, he almost inevitably, he, he's, he's usually his own cinematographer, director, producer, writer. He does everything himself. Um, and this was, this was one that he actually shot for the studio. And this is how baller this guy is. To have final cut on the movie, he had to keep it under two hours. The running time on this film is one hour, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. Yeah, that's baller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this uh, movie is about the real um, 1919 um, World Series and the scandal. Um, John Sayles is very big on um, societal justice and workers' rights and things like that. That's a huge kind of um, theme throughout many of his movies and he really kind of takes that approach with this one where it's about you know why these players did what they did and a big part of it is because they were getting paid nothing mm -hmm. um, you know like back at a time when you know things were tough yeah well it, you it, know it, well I mean things were tough but it's also you know these guys had to you know back then, you know, athletes did not make the kind of money that they make now. These guys had to have jobs in the off season and they lived in the same neighborhood as the fans. And the Duke you know, was kind of cool. I mean, you know, if you're a fan, it's kind of cool, but you know, like, you know, these guys just weren't making a whole lot of money. And, you know, guys like Comiskey, who was the owner of the White Sox at the time would do things to suppress their wages. Like, um, mm. The uh, David Strathern character is a pitcher, and in order to get this like bonus, he had to make a certain number of appearances and get a certain number of wins. And they kept him from pitching for like four or five games, so he didn't get that. Um, and you know, he goes to Comiskey and he's like, "Look, you know, if I had been in those games, I would have gotten this. You know, that would have happened. I want my bonus." And he does, you know. You know, Comiskey's like letter of the law kind of thing. And at that point, David Strathern, who wasn't going to be in on this, is like, screw it. I'm going to get my 10 grand yeah. that I was supposed to get. I'm getting it. Yeah. Um, so the performances that happened in this movie were very interesting because it was a lot of young guys mm -hmm. that now, um, you know, we see quite a bit. Um, well, John Cusack had already been kind of yeah. on his way. Um, Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen. D.B. Sweeney. Yep. And so there was there was quite a few good actors. It was w very well acted. The whole feel and, and production of the movie, it really feels like 1919. Yeah. Like it's not... Which is, uh, I mean, he, John Sayles is just... He's such a good filmmaker. Like that kind of stuff happens. And like he he shot several period pieces. Um, one of my favorite movies is a movie called um, Lone Star, which takes place in two different time periods. So he also goes back in time, but it, you know part of it's set in you know the 1990s when the film was was made. And then there's also a, a piece of it that's told like in the I would say it's probably the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the difference in the two different time periods, even though the sets are largely the same. 
um, there's just a different feel to both those pieces and you kind of feel the time difference. I think there's quite a few, there's quite a few directors that are really good at that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Scorsese is mm -hmm. pretty good at that. Yes. Um, pretty good. You know, Scorsese is all right. Um, and, uh, Wes Anderson actually, he does it in a way where it's like ambiguous. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. is that what I want to say? Yeah. Ambiguous of what? time frame it was the movies are in yeah. um but yeah like there's some that use that are really good at making it a good aesthetic and yeah. and wes anderson movie it's just like is this the 60s 70s or 80s yeah you, yes. you never yeah it's all of them combined <laughs> yeah. even this latest one asteroid city you don't yeah. really even know exactly you know but is, yeah. um yeah, so it, it visually you feel like you're in 1919 mm -hmm. watching these games. I loved the integration of the kids, mm -hmm. the the ones that lived in their neighborhood. They're kind of they're they're the Greek chorus. They are the Greek chorus, yeah, and they're you know selling newspapers, telling you what's going on at the time. Um, they're having conversations with the players on, are you really doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. And, and, uh, it's really good, but you know, it's, it's interesting. Like what Brad was saying, like at the time, these guys were like, yeah, we're, you know, we don't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. I could see why taking the bribe was so, um, was, they decided to do it. They didn't have yeah. any money. They were being cheated out of a lot of money. Yeah. And so it's like they didn't really, I mean, they had a choice, but it's like they need to feed their families. Yeah. And imagine, like, imagine a gambler today trying to get some athlete who's made, I mean, even like the minimum salary of a major league player now is like $600,000. Imagine trying to get a guy who's making $600,000, which by any account is way more money than most people make. Even people that make good wages like, you know, Jerry and I do, we don't come anywhere near to making $600,000 a year. So imagine a gambler trying to convince a guy that's making that kind of money to risk his entire career on throwing games. It's not going to happen, but back in, you know, now imagine that that guy's making barely above minimum wage and he's yeah. not getting the respect that he deserves from his owner. Now all of a sudden, Oh, I can make, you know, 30, 40, 50 times that just by, you know, throwing an errant ball here or, you know, dropping making, a ball, dropping a ball or making a mistake or whatever. Imagine that and that kind of pressure. And that's basically what happens is, you know, it kind of snowballs and you get like eight guys together. The biggest tragedy out of the whole thing is shoeless Joe Jackson, mm -hmm. who's on that team. He's played by D.B. Sweeney. He is considered by many to be one of the top 50 baseball players who ever lived. And by most accounts, um, he was illiterate. And it sounds like he just kind of went, went along with this as yeah, peer dude. pressure to some extent and got duped to some extent. And if you look at his stats... From that series, it's kind of hard to dispute the fact that he was, he really wasn't throwing games, but you know because he was a part of this, he ultimately got banned. He's not in the Hall of Fame. His major league career ended as a result of this. He didn't get to come back and really showcase just how good he was, but largely considered one of so, the, one of the best of all time. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. I feel like. Yeah, see, I feel like nowadays when something scandalous like this happens, mm -hmm. which it has. Well, the last time it really happened was Pete Rose. Okay. Which was like 30 years ago. But wasn't he still coaching and shit? Well, that was the thing. Is like he wasn't playing. He was he was managing, which is my, in some ways considered worse. But like his whole thing was I never bet against the team. But it's like, yeah, but you were betting on the team. So were mm -hmm. you taking risks that you wouldn't normally take yeah. were you putting guys out there that maybe shouldn't have been out there that you know you could have injured their careers or whatever or you know did you kind of run up a score in this game to hit the you know the spread or whatever you know so you know his 
argument on that stuff doesn't come to pass. Um, it's been a bigger issue in basketball. Mm. Um, not with the players, but with a couple of the refs. Um, mm. there's, there's a, there was a huge scandal with one of the refs. Um, there's a couple interesting documentaries on it. Well, I just feel like, like, okay, so didn't the Astros like cheat a couple years ago? Yeah, but I mean, cheating has always been a part of baseball, but this isn't, this wasn't. I mean, I know it's not they, as bad. They, I'm not saying they that. They were cheating to try to win. They weren't cheating to throw a game and win money. It's a little different. So, I mean, it. it's not better. But and why? Why would you cheat to win a game? They were what's taking, their, what's they were taking, their... they were taking, and they were trying to take an advantage. Why? To win the World Series. To. That's what they. That's so what they, they just they cheated for clout. Yeah, I mean that's the whole point of playing the game is to win. Everyone that's that everyone who plays major league baseball, their goal is to one make a major league roster and two to win a world, world series. Is it now? Yeah, I think it is. I think still think it is. You don't think it's money? Well, sure, there's some of that, but a lot of these guys don't make that. I mean, most of those guys want to get to the point where they have, you know, they're not necessarily wealthy, but taken care of for the rest of their lives. But still, in the midst of that, they're trying to win. Mm -hmm. If you're a winning player, you're probably going to make that kind of money. But, you know, it's a thing. Yeah. There's always been cheaters, you know, spitballs and... Yeah. That kind of stuff, and you know. But this movie does a really good job of of sim making you sympathize mm -hmm. with the the players. They're all human, like yeah. They, of all the sports movies that we've seen so far, this one that has the the to me the roundest human characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't just see them as ball players; you see them as human beings who have, you know, all kinds of stuff going on in their life and. You know, like the 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 John Cusack character kind of gets into it, but he kind of he tries to play both sides of the fence. Where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, he he doesn't he doesn't ultimately like change the way that he plays and still gets kicked out anyway. Um, this movie has one of my all time favorite scenes, which is the very last scene of the movie, and it takes place years after this. I think it's like nineteen twenty four or something, and there's this. You know, this guy playing in a, like, Hoboken or something like that. And, you know, there's guys in the stands and they're, you know, they're debating on whether it's Shoeless Joe Jackson. We know it is because it's Stevie Sweeney. And then you just hear a voice talking about Shoeless Joe Jackson and how great he was. And, no, it's not him. And it's John Cusack. Yeah, and he says, no, that's not him. And there's a, there's a shot where D.B. Sweeney looks... And you don't know if he's looking at John Cusack or just at the, I think it's up to interpretation, whether he's looking at John Cusack and acknowledging him that he's there, or if he's just looking at the fans and acknowledging the fans. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a really, really interesting thing where John Cusack is basically saying, you know, that's not him. Just kind of keeping him on the down low because all Shoeless Joe wants to do is play baseball. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, very well done film. Really well acted, good production, like highly recommend watching this movie. What did we score it? I gave it an 87. Jerry gave it an 83. The list score is 85. In my opinion, this is this should not be in the middle of the list. Just no. Be towards the, 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 the high end of this. I mean, at least it's higher than Rollerball. I mean. By the way. Jesus. <laughs> Rollerball. So, um, yeah, let us know what you think in the comments. Is this one of your favorite baseball movies? Um, let us know. Uh, if you'd like to contact us directly, please do so at ratinglist at gmail.com. Uh, but for now, I'm Jerry. I'm Brad. And we're rating the list. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.